later. Or when oh, we're on. live. We're live. There we go. Sorry I, about the delay. Thank God. <laughs> All right, everybody. But I think my chat has been zeroed out, unfortunately. You can't. You yeah. can't talk to anybody on there. No, I, no, I can, but I just can't see the old, the old thing. It also shows zero viewers. So does that? What does that mean? I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know. We had we had people here before, and now they're not here. I don't see any. What I don't see what you see, Jeffrey. Uh, I don't, I don't are you see any other viewers? Are you no. Uh, you, you you don't see any viewers. You don't see. No, I don't have the. You have a Liberty Me screen, so you have like a moderator screen. Oh, I don't. so now I'm the master of ceremonies. Yeah, you're the. <laughs> okay, so what do we do about about uh, the well, link? this archives to YouTube anyway? So I don't it know. It does, yeah. but 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 this link. Uh, uh, okay, so I guess people are now showing up. Okay. But uh, let me. Um, uh, okay, hold on. People, yeah, let's see. Here we go. Here's the live YouTube. Um, okay, here we go. Um, all right, all right. I'm gonna post this YouTube um, link in the chat. Uh huh. And that way, anybody can send it to anybody. I don't know how I suddenly became. Oh, I actually I do know why because I logged as Liberty.me. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. And probably kicked Daniel out, right? Sorry I don't that. think so. I don't. I think he can just come in and out. Okay. Um, but I, I'm a little bit alarmed because usually we have more people than this, and I'm just wondering if the if the, if the link changed. In some it, no, you know what it is? It's continuity. We're normally on Spreecast, and everyone's texting me confused now, even though I posted the link numerous times. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And and because in Liberty.me, the embed is still the Spreecast embed, right? Yeah, uh, no, actually Mike took that off. So if people are going to that site today, they're not getting a link. Well, you can post on liberty.me uh, the uh, the live link. There's the YouTube link. Okay. okay. And there's also an event page on on um, on Google Hangouts. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, uh... I, I you know, there I have a, some sense actually that that these are sort of the early days of these these of this technology in a way. Yep. Uh, I was thinking about this last night because you know here I am on with Austin Peterson and it's still just like wonky and delays and we had to bail from from the meeting. Uh, and you know I wondered if it was like the early days of telephone in a way. You know, like everything exactly kind of vaguely going wrong. You know. I did a show actually. I did a show a couple of weeks ago where I made a joke. I said, you know, this is a new medium. This is the new, you know, medium of news and and entertainment and politics and so on and so forth. But I said we can't get a, we just can't get a steady, you know, uh, signal. You know what I mean? I'm thinking this must, this is this must be, uh, have been what it was like in the 40s. You know what I mean? The 30s and 40s, news reels, problems, radio, things like that. So this works. This works great actually. We can all talk. We just can't figure it out now. It's, that's, you that's know, and isn't it funny how our expectations are? Uh, there's something in the human imagination that that longs for 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 every conceivable miracle, and when they're not here, we're just a little bit bugged by it. Right. Like something like this, it it it, it gives rise to to new possibilities in our mind. It's like exactly. Wow, I should be able to in real time, in a very intimate way, engage person to person, anybody on the planet. And video calls, and moreover, I should add ever more people to the call, and we should all be able to talk in real time, uh, and with no delays, and 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 perfect acoustics, and beautiful high definition video. That's and, right. and 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 when that doesn't happen, we're like, fuck, this is <laughs> this is terrible, you know. What's cool, with to your point, what's cool about it, we fill in all those gaps in our own mind, that ingenuity, you know. And then some people yeah. would think, gosh, I, you know, maybe I should create a system that does this, and how can I improve on it? I think. It's part of the human character, I suppose. It is. That's a good. Now, point. I feel this. I feel this uh, sometimes when I get on when I'm on, a, on an airplane. I'm flying and uh, and I'm using you because know, they, you know, when airlines don't have Wi-Fi anymore, we're like, what kind of Flintstones thing is this? <laughs> and, and so, so when you do get on Wi-Fi, and then I'll sometimes get Skype calls, you know, Skype video calls from multiple people, and I'll try to answer them, and I and I can't do it, and they're like annoyed, like. 
what the hell's wrong? And I'm like, right. I don't know. I mean, this is bad. Right. <laughs> I'm ticked off when I can't watch a Netflix movie from my phone. And I'm thinking, wait a minute here. I'm watching a movie on my phone, and I'm mad because it doesn't come. It skips sometimes. You know? So it's like going back to the days of the VHS when sometimes it was so the picture was so dark you didn't know. I remember watching The Godfather on VHS. I couldn't see a thing. Now I have my phone. It's high definition, and I'm mad when it skips. Yeah, I ha you know it's funny. I, I, there's, I, I, everybody has one in every office. There's some one person who's on top of all the newest technology, you know, and uh, <clears throat> and I'm at the Foundation for Economic Education, so I, I brought in my my iMac, which I you know paid like twenty four hundred dollars for, you know, like yeah. eight, eighteen months ago, right? It's got a giant screen. It's like the epic computer of all time. And so my friend Richard Lawrence, who's the chief operating officer, I invited him over and said, have a look at my machine. What do you think? You know, I, I was feeling really good about this. He, he took one look and he goes, he goes, oh, no retinas display, huh? Uh. Said, you can tell <laughs> oh, that. that it doesn't burn your eyes open, huh? <laughs> yeah, and he said, I said, how, how did you know that? And he goes, oh, I, I can tell five feet away. I mean, just one quick look, everything's blurry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. It, yeah, to him it probably looked like the first television at the World's Fair. You know what I mean? <laughs> and to me, I I haven't even, I don't even know what a retina display looks like actually. I don't mine looks great and I have a I don't know. You know, I saw one at the Mac store, you know, a few months ago. The salesman was going, Here's a retina display and here's the old fashioned crappy display. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the two and I I just I didn't I don't see, see it. Yeah, I don't either. But I, I got, he says, uh, Richard says that that once you get the retina display, you adjust to it, and sure. and then and then everything else just looks pathetic by comparison. Right. So. If, if you think too that the televisions, the first high def televisions, I remember looking at them being like, oh, this is unbelievable. You know what I mean? And what was it, 1999, 2000? I think they started to get big, and then a few years later, it's like, geez, you, I'm like touch, going to touch the screen and think my hand's going to get wet. You know what I mean? It's amazing how it. Uh, I know. And I, you know, and it's funny too because I, you know, it's like, like I love all the new technology, but I'm not, I'm not entirely unhappy with the old. You know, I, right. I guess I, I have this memory. You know, uh, like, like truly, and I think, I think my parents maybe were a little bit not quite up on the newest thing in a way, but I mean, truly, gentlemen, this is actually a true story. I re I remember, and I might have been maybe five or something like that. And my parents might have been ten years late getting this. But when we when we got our first color television, I mean, I actually remember this. And it was it was um, I guess we got it on Saturday or something like that. And uh, Sunday night came, and all we wanted to watch was the opening for the show that was on Sunday night. In the old days, there was you know there were only three. Read network television, you know, station, and there was a, a thing called the Wonderful World of Disney, and the opening had this peacock feathers, right? And that's all we wanted to see was, was <laughs> the peacock feathers. And so my parents actually kept us home from church. Uh oh. Yeah, on Sunday night, so that we could watch the opening. Wow. So, yeah, that was, the, and and yeah, that was a big deal because I never imagined something like that would happen. Like, you know, is God going to strike us down, you know, immediately? <laughs> yeah, because we want consumer, to Yeah, consumer decadence. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, those things yeah, are cool. I, yeah, and I, so anyway, I still have this vague memory of this. So when I was out shopping for a television the other day, um, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, saw, I saw one for sale on, on Craigslist, and it was like 28 inches, and I thought, well, that's plenty. And, and, and somebody said, to me, oh, no, you can't possibly have a 20. That's pathetic. I mean, you have to at least get 42. So I found one that was 48, right? I thought, well, 48. I mean, that's, you know, who needs a television that big? And then I, I sent the link to another friend. I said, what do you think about this one? And she writes back and she says, you know what? These days, 70 inches is just what everybody should get. So <laughs> don't get 70 inches. You will fa feel a profound sense of regret in a matter of weeks. So just go for the seventy inch now. <laughs> yeah, seventy I, inches, man. Seventy, I know, right? Like I need my whole house filled up. That's huge. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good with forty-seven inches. I don't need. Yeah. What else do I need? Yeah, I don't know. I th I got something like that. They so. should make. I, they should actually enact a law that limits the size of televisions <laughs> to give government something else to do because I think it's bored. 
if that's that, possible. That could happen. I mean, any any way they can make us suffer. suffer right? You know? Over I mean, hire more bureaucrats. I think it's a little yeah. bit of both. There's two incentives there. Make the people suffer and hire my friends. <laughs> that's it. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> We're all living too well, and it's the job of government to, That's uh, right. to, to, put, to, to put an end to that. You know, you know these, this, this pesky production, and oh, it's really a terrible thing. Well, you see what's happening in California. I, I think it's just a beautiful illustration of the nature of government, you know, the way they're, they're limiting uh, water. Oh, it's unbelievable. You know? um, <laughs> right? I'm, uh, in, I'm in L.A., and that's all people are talking about. And why? Why is there no? It smells like shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think I had the camera on me like entirely just now. Uh, oh, I, that happens when if you're talking, it'll go all on you. If I talk, it'll go all on me. I, and I know, talks. but I think I had the the video switched. Oh, I see. Permanently I see. on me. So I'm that's all right. That. If Grant could do that, that's what he would probably do the same thing, but keep it like that and act like he didn't notice. Because <laughs> Grant is a noted narcissist. Oh, a complete but, narcissist. <laughs> But no, that's an interesting point you bring up with the water. And I think I, I think it was at the Libertarian Republic. I don't remember. I saw a little quip about Milton Friedman saying, if you put the government in charge of the desert, you'll have a shortage of sand in five years. Yeah. You know, and it's the same thing with the water in California. You have them in charge of allocating a resource, and we have a shortage here now. And they're surprised. Oh, there's a drought. This is a desert. Okay? That's not that's nothing new. Um, so you're exactly right, Jeffrey. I don't I don't know why people still think that, and, and, and no one blames the government. For it, if 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 Sam's Club or Costco does something incorrectly, oh Costco or Sam's or Walmart or you know, but when the government does it, I don't hear anybody getting upset about it. You know well, what I mean? and I was uh, listening to uh, National Public Radio, and they were reporting on this California situation, and and they said, well, you know, the government's really starting to crack down. First it was a recommendation, then it was a law, and now now they realize that it's really important to enforce this. So um, so they said, you know, they found the first real violator, the first. The first real, I forget now what the word they used, but it was like scoff law or something. I mean, they used some like sort of wicked term to describe a person who was watering his lawn. It's probably like a throwback term too to like uh, the seventh century. Right, and, and they said they said well, and so uh, it turned out to be a franchise owner of a McDonald's who, in uh, the middle of the middle of the night, was watering no. the lawn. And but this was caught on a video camera. And the man was quickly ratted out, and you know the so, inhumanity. Yeah, right. So this person was, you know, <laughs> and and so uh, properly fined, dragged down to city hall, and fined, you know. And it's uh, a big fine. It's not a. It's not a little fine. It's right. uh, It's over five hundred dollars, I think. And it depending McDonald's, they probably hammered. So well, I know that's and, a personal fine. Right, and you know the other thing is like like why is McDonald's watering watering its lawn? I mean, it's like a public service. I mean, they they right. want. They want to have beautiful things for other people. And this Curb appeal not, here. Right. It, it, this is not like some guy's home, and he's just like right. in, a, in a, you know, in an egotistical, you know, self-indulgent right. way, wanting his green grass for whatever who's, reason. Like, who's going to go to a McDonald's when you see the little yellow stains, or your grass is dying, or your bushes are on? I'm like, I'm not going to eat in there. Right. You know what I mean? So you know how many people you're harming by creating an incentive not to water or water their shrubs, and then the people it harms that are working inside of it. And, 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 and for a majority of the reason is the smelt fish, this little fish that they were concerned about that they never kept, they never maintained water. They could have kept the water, but they let it flow out, all out into the San Francisco Bay over the years because, <laughs> because these politicians caved to environment, the lobbyists. You know what I mean? That's how resources are allocated through government, through lobbyists. Who pays me the most? Who gives me the most political power? And then we all suffer here. It's un it's incredible. Well, I and I don't remember the data, cause, even though I've read it, you know. But, but it's always shocking when you read it, like like what percentage of California water use is actually you know domestic, you know, like right. Not much of it. Not much. I mean, no. it's very very low. And seventy three percent is in the is for the um is the inland uh, farms agriculture, and then I think yeah, less than I think it's about twenty percent. Is left to the is is allocated to the cities or so on, but I could be I don't remember it well, exactly. If, if you look at okay, so I read somewhere that it's 1.2 gallons for a flush to flush the toilet, five gallons to take a shower. So if you figure conservatively, let's say three flushes per person, one shower per day, over what is it 40 million people every day doing that? That's a lot of damn water <laughs> every single yeah, day using. 
So to think right. that uh, that that resource can be centrally planned, it, it's really is of no shock to me that there's a right. threat right now. That's well, yeah. it's true in a way. But you know, I, I I I when I was writing all this stuff about toilets and everything, I actually looked up like nationwide water use, and I was shocked to see that water domestic water consumption um, is something like yeah, it's it's a lot, but it amounts to something like three percent of the total. Yeah. Yeah, I read that one. That was good. What, I think do we, what do we export more water to other countries or something? Well, I think it's mostly industrial and industrial and use and, and agricultural use. You know, yeah. so so the, if you put a brick in your to toilet, you know, it might make you feel good or something. But um, and also, you know, the strange thing about it is like it's pretty darn important that we have good systems to to clean out our pipes and get rid of human waste and and wash our clothes and you know just normal. That's a net positive. Yes. Yeah. These are things that kind of need to be done. Grant, uh, right, did you listen to that? Did you hear that, Grant? You see how important that is? I tell him off air all the time how important that is. He still hasn't picked up on that yet, though. Will, your hair is greasy as shit. Don't even that talk is not about it. That's, that's, that's natural, and yes, I am an Italian-American, so you are a bigot. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> do, you yeah. put, do you put that stuff in your hair? Do you have the special stuff that you put in here? Because yeah. some people do that. No, I do. I actually put stuff in my hair. I put a little yeah. olive oil in there and some uh, some marinara sauce. You know what I mean? Marinara. Well, so the, <laughs> these can be expensive. These products. I, I once was going through an a, a TSA, you know, sort of uh, airport thing, right? And oh. and I got like, yeah, right? And I know. Right? Okay, you know about this. Maybe you yeah. really got. So anyway, went through the scanner and they pulled out like you know it was like a hair cream thing like this, and the guy had. He was a good-looking guy, and he had like big head of hair, and yeah. it was like you know sort of cool-looking and everything. And they grabbed his hair thing, you know, his like stuff, and like held it up, you know, to the to the mobs, and was like, "What is this?" You know, yeah. it was really embarrassing for him. Yeah, because <clears throat> oh. he's like, "Oh, well, it's kind of the stuff I like put in my hair," you know. Yeah. And people were, like staring, you know, a lot of rubbernecking going along, you know, going on in the in the security line, and they took the stuff from him. And they took it and threw it away. And for all I know, this stuff costs, you know, like fifty dollars. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, right. No, my stuff costs. That happened to me. I had a big. I had just bought a big tub of it, and I forgot to put it in my my luggage thing. Will you just pork cost, fat? <laughs> yeah, pork fat costs. My thing costs thirty dollars. The guy takes it out. I go, "What are you doing?" He goes, "You can't take this on the airplane." Oh, and I'm like, what am I going to do? Bomb. Put it in the trash can, right? Yeah. I go. I know my gel, my gel's pretty rough stuff, but it's not going to take an airplane down. Well, you know, moreover, when has that ever happened? That you know, a uh, uh, Italian American kid flying at a JFK with a tub of explosives in his hair gel thing. I mean, Jesus, come on! That killed me. I was pissed. I was so twenty-five that, bucks. That really did happen to you. That is it very interesting. That's I, amazing because I saw this happen to a guy. I felt so bad for him. Um, first of all, it was humiliating, but it was also robbery. You know? Right? No, it is, but, and I wasn't humiliated at all. I was pissed. I go, I don't care. They wait all day. I've I've checked multiple firearms onto a plane before and picked them up on the other end of the of the airport. Really? Oh, multiple like, times. Like, wait, multiple you times. Handguns, rifles. No, no, I've checked them. Like checked luggage. Oh, yeah, yeah, you luggage. could do that. Yeah. I don't think, but don't you have to declare them or something? I'm not yeah, you have to declare them. them. They give you a little sheet. You you don't pay any extra money. That you declare them. They give you their stamp of approval, and it's off you go. That's cool. But uh, but it's the TSA that's you know just so so absurd you know. Oh, uh, every yeah. time they bother me too. I don't understand what it is about me. Take your sweater off. What do you mean? I'm it's freezing. I gotta take like you know what a nightmare walking through this. And then thing. they uh, they tell you that don't worry, we'll have the technology soon to where you don't have to take your shoes off. Well, good, <laughs> good, finally. Yeah. It's only been a few I, years. <laughs> I will be right. taking my shoes off forever. I know this because I I have. The shoes that I wear have steel in uh, in the uh, what do you call it? You know steel the toe? Thing. not not in the toe, but in in the shank. You know, yeah. um, because they're Alden shoes, and I so I just know that. <laughs> it's always the case, but mostly mostly uh, TSA leaves me alone. Where I have trouble is in going across the borders, uh, particularly Ooh. to other countries in Canada. Um, and, and it's because they it, because they always suspect that I'm up to no good um, um, because of the way I'm dressed. Yeah, well, I look always, at that outfit. You must be a gangster. Like it's what are you? A gangster thing, right? They yeah. think I'm, I'm doing a drug deal. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm a pimp. You know, right? 
I mean, the bow tie. Grant never, Grant never has that problem. No one ever mistakes Grant for a pimp, I'll tell you that. Drug dealer, on the other hand. <laughs> yeah, all the time. You know, oh, neo neo Nazi constantly. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but we bust each other's balls in the show quite a it's bit. Good. It's good. It's good. But, um, you know, I, I even have, have had to open like they'll say, "What? What the hell? You th you claim you're coming to Canada for uh, for pleasure? I mean, clearly in that outfit, you're you're here for business, right?" So I have to explain to them, like, I dress this way all the time. And I've uh, <laughs> twice now had to actually prove it to them by opening up my suitcase and showing them, like, that I've traveled, yeah. like, like, 30 bow ties or whatever, you know. Unbelievable. Yeah. And and then they finally sort of more or less believe me and, and let me through. But Just one, go, to, go to Google they, Images and Google your name and right. show them every, in every picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one time they actually grabbed, uh, confiscated my phone and kept it for, for 30 minutes, which I'm sure that meant that they mirrored the thing, right? This right. Before the new iOS, you know, that encrypts all your data. So they got, at least the Canadian government knows everything there is to know about me, which right. doesn't particularly worry me that much just because it's Canadian government, but, you know. <laughs> you hear that, Canada? He's not worried about you. And neither <laughs> am I. You and your damn free health care. Yeah. <laughs> You're still trying to come, well, they don't, no one wants to come here anymore. There's actually nowhere to go. Isn't it funny? Where Americans don't think of Canada as being even slightly threatening. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I know. I love Canada. I love their cities. So I have a good time when I go up there. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like Toronto and so on, and watching the Rangers. Party town. Yeah. Uh, the best, the best place in Canada that I've ever been is, is Vancouver. But uh, do you know the Vancouver? Have you ever been? I've never been. Only on the. I've only been on the East Coast. Never the West. Yeah. So Vancouver is like you know this term privilege is made up to describe Vancouver. Like you know, it's just like over the top. Everything is amazing. Everything is beautiful. It's just the, the most. Yeah. Uh, I just can't. It's just like inconceivably amazing. That, I hear a lot about the women there all the time. My buddies are going. We got to go to Vancouver. I hear everything's really nice. So I, I that's what I hear. And I, oh. say, I'd rather go to Manhattan. I think that's better for me anyway. I'm from there and I know it. I know there's, you know. The women of Vancouver are f famous, huh? Yeah. That's what I yeah. yeah. That, I don't. I I find that hard to believe too. But maybe so, if so the hookers are famous. Good. That's a big, yeah. big surprise there. <laughs> I hear they have a great red light district. Grant told me that via text <laughs> just now. <laughs> a couple times. Well, I hope your mom's not watching, Grant, because everything <laughs> I said about you is true. <laughs> so. But, but I've been there. I've been there now twice, and I no, or three times, or something like that. Yeah, three times, three times. Um, but for me personally, I mean, one of the reasons I don't like to go there is it's like a full day of travel, right? So it's like five or six or I don't know, seven hours or something, uh, and it's just dreadful. And then you get a time change coming back, mm -hmm. so so you leave early in the morning and like you arrive at your home like late at night, you know. So <laughs> that's just that's just ugh, exhausting. Is anybody watching us yet, or are we? No, we've got yeah, we've got a lot of viewers. We do. I'll let this is. I wanted to go into this. So you know what? And let me give introductions first. Okay. Let me, let me introduce Grant. I know we've been talking, but let me get into Grant here, who writes at the, uh, who runs the Modern Libertarian. You see how I got it now, Grant? Fuck you, finally. Yeah, I got it. I got it. And uh, writes for the Libertarian Republic. Writes some really good pieces there, and also an admin at We Are Capitalists. Um, I still don't know why they let him on there. I mean, such a great site with such great integrity. Let's riff raff like this. Than I, mean, um, I myself, co-creator of the Analytical Conservative, um, also an admin at Unbiased America, and Grant and I work together at the Citizen Scholars. As of right now, we both write there, which is a good website as well. And with us tonight, kind enough to lend us his time, who has a very busy schedule hanging out in Canada <laughs> in Vancouver and getting stuck there on the border, is uh, Jeffrey Tucker, CLO at Liberty Me. You've probably seen him speak wherever it is that you live at. Certainly, Yallers know all about Jeffrey Tucker and people who follow Liberty Me. His pieces are excellent. And that's what I want to get into is your piece on Hillary Clinton and the election. I want to start there. I think people are really interested in that. You had a good piece on that. And, you. You, and it was. I think your premise was generally identity politics. And I, this ticks me off the most. Um, that what is you said it, you said it in your piece. You said that Barack Obama's campaign and Hillary Clinton's campaign are going to be the exact same thing. The only difference really is is identity politics. Can you elaborate on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, well, I mean, we, I mean, you said it, right? I mean, like, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's really a bit for me. It's, it's offensive because, you know, Black Americans struggled for, for, for so long, uh, for just to be treated as, as full right citizens, 
um, you know, we, we got slavery, then we got, we got the draft, and then Jim Cray, Crow and the whole rise of the regulatory state and, and labor regulations systematically beating people back, eugenics, uh, on racial grounds, right? And so mm -hmm. the struggle continued and continued and continued, and like very recently, in a, in a brief moment, uh, we have you know, some semblance of, of full rights for black Americans. And then, and then, and then the whole movement gets like poured into this political centralism. It's like a funnel. It's like, okay, if you really, really think that it's it, that uh, the full liberation of Black Americans is something in favor, vote for this guy. Right. And then we'll see the the apotheosis. You know. Right. But it's not the apotheosis. It's it's in fact, if anything, it's it's at best irrelevant. But in fact, in Obama's case, I think that actually it, it's not done any good for Black Americans. Whatsoever. Right, and it, it's ironic in a sense too that so, the state which subjugates so many people and has subjugated so many people and still does to this day that they would encourage people, oh, you want you want true freedom and liberation, vote for more government. I don't see. Oh, it's terrible for everybody, but it's just particularly effective right. and manipulative when it takes place. You know, designed to just appeal to demographics that can basically lie to people. And in right. this Hillary Clinton case, it's 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 especially offensive because we're talking about half the human race here, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, like if you look at you know whatever six eight thousand years of recorded history, most mostly women have been li lived in a state of subjugation uh, to men. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the way it's always been. Property, they're you know they've not been allowed to make contracts. They've never been considered full right citizens. Uh, misogyny has been the defining a defining mark of the whole of human history. You know we began to crawl out of it at the Enlightenment. Capitalism meant huge advances for for women, the right to contract marriages, um, and the right to say say no. You know, <laughs> uh, for example, and and then in the 19th century we get you know um, uh, the right to in, inherit. And and other great um, advances for women, and I I cite in my article there's a great um, essay, really book by John Stuart Mill called um, the subjection of women, and it's it's really a, a beautiful what I like to think of as sort of first wave uh, feminism, and the, I mean you don't have to call it feminism. All it is is recognizing every human being as a human being, right? That's all all it was about. So we have this long struggle. And then here you here you go. You know the whole the whole movement gets poured into this this one woman's campaign to achieve political right. power, as as if that's going to do anything for women as such. In fact, and I argue this in my piece, it's going to do the opposite because all of her policies are in fact going to be materially right. evil and and damaging to to women in the workforce. I agree. Uh, everyone in the workforce. Yeah, it, yeah everyone. Really. Yeah, everyone in the world. And and here's the thing. And in a lot of their politics and the way they run their campaign is pure balkanization. Um, they separate people based on groups. Ex identity politics and so far as oh, you know, it's the patriarchy. Um, women are, are are equal pay for equal work. It's really like you know that everybody's out to get these people. Let's divide everyone. I don't see many people are certainly Democrats of late. Uniting people, you know. Uh, no, and and government is inherently divisive too. Right. I mean, like, I, don't, I don't care if it's white males or, or black women or yeah. you know, just it doesn't matter who's running the state. It's going to be divisive. To right. Be divisive. I think leftism, their ideology, it depends on it. Without it, I don't think it lasts really very long. To be honest, um, you also got into equal pay, um, for equal work, and this is always a great topic. I don't, no matter how many times it's explained. Uh, empirical data has shown uh, people can't understand that women make different choices than men in the workplace, um, and they feel that there's all, the only solution thereof is government. Can you elaborate on that a little bit too? Yeah, so that's an extremely important topic. I mean, uh, to me, the critical issue is whether passing laws are going to improve the plight of women in the workforce today or not. And and women have a perception that they are not treated uh, fairly and that they have more barriers to get through than, than men and um, face more obstacles to professional success than men. And I'm not prepared to argue against that. I mean, I, 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 in fact, I'm fully happy to concede that. The, the, the question is whether or not this equal pay laws are actually going to do anything to fix that problem. Right. And I think it's 
it's absolutely the case that they'll not only not fix the problem, they'll make it vastly worse. And, and if I can just explain this really, Go ahead. you have to kind of <clears throat> you have to kind of think about the way the workplace works, right? So in the first place, um, you're basically putting government in charge of the pay of everyone under a under a law of equal equal pay for equal work. I mean, so suddenly government is a, has a veto position over what everybody's paid, men and women both. I mean, which is already we've got a problem because that's a that's basically socialism. Okay, mm -hmm. that's like central planning. And if and if you know government well, they don't make very good decisions about that. But I mean, leaving that aside. Notice that the way the laws work, it's equal pay for equal work. So if you're if you've got a woman and you don't want to pay her a gigantic uh, salary uh, equal to some some man, the way to deal with it is just to not give her equal work. In other words, you bump her down the corporate ladder a step so that she does get equal pay for equal work. But the point is that you deny her like more right. serious work and a more advanced stage in the firm. So as long as you can kind of keep Women on a lower level right. uh, within the, within the corporate hierarchy, then you can comply with the law. So what the law actually does is disincentivize advancement. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the other thing is this: <clears throat> if you know how firms work, like you get promotions uh, through a firm, but not less. They don't always come with pay advances. Sometimes the pay is uh, the promotion itself. So let's say you're you're earning 150k as as a you know, executive, you know, something or other, and, and you want to be promoted to vice president. That itself is your pay under the mm -hmm. current system, but you continue to work, work on 150K, say. But, right. but, but the other vice presidents are, let's say they're men, and they're, they're earning maybe 200, 250K because they've been doing it now for, right. for four, five, ten years or whatever. You're the new, and you're a woman, you're the new employee. Well, under the equal pay, equal law, Equal, equal work for equal pay, uh, equal pay for equal work law, you would have to be immediately bumped up to the same pay scale as all your male employees at that same level within the firm, no matter how long they've been there. So, in other words, you've got a gigantic glass ceiling now um, and, and a huge disincentive to any kind of uh, promotion. Right. So, so what, it, what it does is actually it, it incentivizes management. I don't care whether it's the, the management is men or women to always keep women in the lowest possible level uh, as, a, as a kind of a money-saving tactic, you know? Uh -huh. um, there's nothing that the law does to guarantee promotions. All it does is guarantee equal pay. That does not right. necessarily mean high pay. Right. And let me, let me, get, let me uh, challenge you on one point here and go, yeah. to, and go to Grant. I, I agree with a lot of your points. Um, I, and you can concede the fact that perhaps there is a bit of misogyny, a bit of bias in the marketplace. But I don't think I don't think the data would show that. I think if you compare apples to apples, and most of the statistics do show that when and women, when compared, equal comparisons in education, work experience, and so on and so forth. In some instances, women actually earn more than men. Um, so I, I, I mean, oh, sure. that's let's, absolutely true. So, but let's so let's say that let's say that your point, yes, um, perhaps maybe I think poorly of women when I'm looking to hire somebody. I in the marketplace, I can't find anybody as good as this gal that works for me now. I'm forced to pay her more, or somebody else will come along and take her, or I'm in a place with a limited market. I, I you know, it really lim I think the market, whether you feel that way or not. I think the market really kind of um, ameliorates those feelings and those prejudices. You, you know what I mean? So it, I think it, it, that it, it cancels them. Yeah, it cancels them out entirely. Yeah, um, and I completely agree with you uh, with the proviso that uh, if if it were a perfectly uh, if it were a perfectly free market, or at least it were a market, the problem with the modern workforce is it's not always a very well functioning market, and, right. and that's mostly because of of terrible interventions, but yes. entirely because of interventions, like like healthcare is the single, right. I'm convinced it's the single worst thing that's happened to... I would, I would one-up you and say government schooling's part of the problem. I would one-up, I would one-up and say minimum wage laws hurt people insofar as accumulating hum, uh, the accumulation of human capital in the workplace. Yeah. I think it was it Sowell who said that the real minimum wage is zero. These people can't get into the workplace, they can't accumulate skills in the marketplace, and they go nowhere. What can they do? Other than they're priced out of the market by welfare, uh, most uh, government largesse most of the time, and they stay on it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think. What do you, Grant? I want to get Grant in here. What do you think about government's role uh, uh, in subduing people, and certainly in the marketplace, 
And how would the market ameliorate things like that? Well, I think the labor market in the U.S. is not at all what a free labor market would look like. And and to your point, minimum wage has probably been, in the long run, the single most destructive policy. That, coupled with uh, arguably affirmative action uh, and, and these sort of pursuits of this equal pay law, I, I don't see that really going anywhere. It doesn't make any sense in, in real reality. Uh, I, I was in a, having a conversation today with somebody about... Um, Equal pay laws and just if if in fact men are paid more for the same work as women, then if a profit-seeking firm trying to maximize profit, meaning reduce costs, why the hell would they ever hire a man if it's just if they're going to get less money if they're going to have to shell out less money for a woman? But anyways, um, that's all true. I think that's true. It, you know, grant, again, once gra granted that there's. A, that, that it is a well-functioning market. And, and this is where I think employment is a lot stickier than it was 100 years ago. Um, right. Mostly as a result of all the invent interventions that have taken That's place correct. Basically yeah. since, since the progressive era. Grant, you said something interesting, and I, and I, I kind of, I, I'm curious about this. Uh, did you mean to say that you don't think there's any chance of these laws ever passing? Equal pay laws? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't see an equal pay law unless it's shoved through a fully Democrat Congress. I don't really see an equal pay law, at least not at the federal level. State level, I mean, I'm sure there. I, I don't know if I hope you're right. Off cuff, I hope you're right. Off cuff, I don't, I don't know if any states have actually passed equal pay. I know that federal federal contractors have to abide by equal pay. Executive That's order. A, that was an executive order, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know if. Like a federal outright equal I mean, pay I law, whatever. Right actually, <laughs> but I, uh, I mean, aff affirmative action passed, but that was in kind of a haste of civil rights conundrums and, and just sort of back and forths and uh, knee jerk reactions. But again, there you see another instance where the government tries to intervene in the labor market to solve racial disparities, and I, I don't know who said it exactly, but. The political solution is always a short-term solution. It's always, oh, look what we can fix tomorrow, yeah. but who cares what's going to happen five years from now? Because at that time, said politician is already elected to a higher place or re-elected to his own office, so who cares? So I, grant, uh, and I, I think I like, that's the racial disparity right. we see today, the gender Go disparities ahead, we see today, everything. Right. Well, I, so grant, I mean, I'm just, I'd, like to, I'd like to think you're right, and probably like two years ago, I would have probably agreed with you there's no chance of this. But um, you know that 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 like the Democrats are like really seriously dedicated to this equal pay for equal work proposition. It was like the number one uh, feminist, and I resent the, that term being applied to this to this agenda. It's the the number one thing that they're that they're pushing for. Right. And and um, I mean governors all over the country uh, who are, are Democrats ran on that platform, and now we've got Hillary Clinton who's the you know, likely uh, nominee for for president. <clears throat> I agree. Like the number one thing. I mean, it. it I don't know. I mean, maybe I, it's, maybe it's crazy, but uh, I agree. This is a good segue, actually, because look, I don't have any faith in the Republicans either, who continually cave. Yeah. Um, I don't see them. I don't see them ever stand up for market principles. And look what happened under George W. Bush, um, who was probably a, a big government. Uh, Republican politician who had control of Congress, Republicans had control, and they bloated government. They grew government. I, I, I wouldn't put it past, I mean, look, I don't think anytime soon Republicans would pass that if they controlled both houses of the Congress. I wouldn't put them past it of growing government in other ways to get around it and not having to do it directly. Um, the, the spending was, I don't have really any faith in either party. I, I wish I did. And I, people always excoriate me for this, but I don't have faith in the Republicans in protecting the market. George W. Bush, I think his famous line was, "I have to violate the free market in order to save it." I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> this isn't this isn't this is insanity. I, I just can't believe there's parties that this is a this is the party of the party of liberty. That's nonsense. And I and here's another and, and here's a good segue into a Hillary Clinton or what's the difference, Jeffrey, between Hillary Clinton or if Jeff, if Jeb Bush is elected, he's another corporatist. Look at the donors. He's getting these big corporatist donors. Um, I don't see much of a difference really between the two. Perhaps a little bit of a degree, maybe in, uh, gun rights and so on. But what's the difference between, let's say, Hillary or Jeb is elected? Is there really a difference? I, I think I don't. 
Um, yeah, that is really hard to say. I mean, part of my confusion about politics is it's very unclear to me what the relationship is between who we elect and the policies we get. You know, and, and, and it's hard to sort of predict that in advance. I mean, you can sort of listen to what they say in their debates and look at their platforms, but whether or not that's actually what they do when they get in office and how much power they have. You know, I, I just, I don't know. And I would include, I mean, I, like I'm, I'm friends with Rand Paul. I've known him for many, many years. And I think his heart is in the right place. <clears throat> but I'm not, it's not even obvious to me how much power he actually has to, to make a difference. I mean, you know, <clears throat> in the end, the bureaucrats are running this country. You know, we've got a deep state. It's the, not an elected state. The it's administrative state. state kills us. It, it kills us. Right. That's yeah. the thing that's ruling this country. It's not right. so much the elected politicians anymore. That's a hard thing to kind of like come to terms with. And the thing about that too, well, Jeffrey, it's it's wholly insulated from the executive. It's wholly insulated from the president. I, th I think some, some bureaucracies in the administrative state are under two levels of just cause employment. They can't just be fired, which I think yeah. is is incredible. That's tyranny, is it not? Sure. Go, go, Grant. Go ahead. So okay, so so let me. I, I don't. I'm not totally sound on the political structure of the United States, but this is the way I see it. Is the administrative state not under the power of the executive? So let's yes. just say the executive could wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know what, I want to close down the no, FCC. Cannot. The FCC and, is and, okay, and and if if they could or they did do that, let's say the FDA closed down tomorrow. What would be the short-term market effect of that? Would that not cause enormous economic disruption? No. Uh, not no, that I'm, I'm not. In, I'm not saying no, no, that's a good, good or bad good, thing. I'm just. It's worth mentioning. That's a good question. I I think it would spur ingenuity. It would lower the barriers to entry and making it, drugs. In the long run, run, you might be correct, but in the short term, could that I, cause? It would, it, no, I think it would take time for people to adjust. I think it's what's harmful is what's happening now. And I think that it would take a long. I think the problem is it would take a long time for people to adjust. That would be the only. That would be the only problem insofar as it relates to the immediate effects. Go ahead, Jeffrey. What do you think? Oh well, I'm an anarchist. I mean, you don't need to ask me that question. I'm, yeah, I'm I know. The whole thing immediately. I don't care. I'm a conservative. Uh, I agree. I, I think that <laughs> it's the. That's the problem. Is the FDA was this thing that was cre a government solution to a problem they made up, and that's generally a lot what a lot of these bureaucracies are. And the president, no, the president can't shut these down. He can't even fire a lot of the people in the administrative state. Again, they have a they have a level of just cause employment. They're insulated entirely from the body politic. So I, th I mean, I think this is what um, what de Tocqueville called the soft tyranny, yeah. and what, what what to Jefferson called democratic despotism at its finest. And and yeah. and the thing is, is that people, so many people are so ignorant of it. How do you? And you're right, Jeffrey. It doesn't matter if Rand Paul is elected president. That's one step in the right direction. Maybe, but it's it's one yeah. small step. What's, but what's we we have wildly inflated expectations about the presidency. Right. I mean, one of the things that Austin Peterson said to me last night, just like in passing, he said, if Rand Paul gets elected, there won't be any more spying. I said, wait, hold on just a minute. Do you actually believe that Rand Paul will get rid of the NSA, the CIA, and the FBI? I mean, do you actually believe that? Do you think that any president actually has that power right. to pull that? And he, pull, and he backed away and goes, well, okay, yeah. I mean, no, it's ridiculous. It's, I mean, it's just, just one absurd. step. It's one small step in the right direction, and even there, you have to hold their feet to the fire. Look, I think the biggest problems, an apathetic public. Um, I think they just. I don't. I, I think that you know the Democrats offer things that are more tangible and government largesse and so on and so forth, where liberty is so entirely intangible, and people don't really understand what liberty is until they until they lose it, really. And I hope that's not yeah. the path we take. That it, whatever small liberty we have left. You, 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 know, know? you were talking about Tocqueville, and you know, and I, I, I love so much democracy in America, and I, I think everybody ought to read, reread that book, like yes. you know, every couple of years. I mean, I read it, I reread it six, eight months ago, and I was just like, like in love with this guy. You know, blown away. Yeah. It's incredible that people would think. How do people thought like that? You, there's no thinkers. I don't see anybody thinking like that. I don't know anybody who's reading yeah. the Tocqueville. It's, he's so good, and it's free. Like, download it on right. your. Samsung, for God's sake. I mean, Same with Bastiat's The Law. I mean, look at how relevant these things are to know. today. But, you, you know, know Tokyo is writing but what we had back in those days, a spoils system, and, and, and that was a good system because what it meant was the elected politicians were in charge of the bureaucracy. Right. They could fire, fire anybody right. you know, immediately. And that led to a lot of you know, what people said in the day is, like, corruption. Okay, like, you fire all the existing guys and hire all your guys. Okay, like, 
I actually prefer that system mm -hmm. to our current system where they can do that. And right. what that means is that the permanent state, the the structure of 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 employees that that have these permanent jobs that are protected under labor union contracts right. and, and everything, um, they laugh at the latest office holders. I mean, somebody gets appointed to the head right. of state department or, or HUD, they're like, oh, right. who's, who's the new who's the new <laughs> pretty face, you know, occupying that big office downstairs? Fuck that guy. I mean, they don't care. You right. know, I mean, you know, it's it, the electoral politicians have essentially no power of the bureaucracy at all. And and that all began in like what was it like the 1880s? Yes, the, uh, I think it was the 1890s. It was the Hatch I forgot the name of the act, not the Hatch Act. It was the something act where they got rid of the spoil system. It was the late 1800s, early 1900s. I can't yeah. remember precisely the name the name of the act that got rid of this. But, but you're right. It was important because it meant that that the people that uh, that are elected actually have real real power. Mm -hmm. um, over 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 the government, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas now the government like exists as this separate thing, and then you have these this sort of crew of people that are coming and going through these election cycles, and mm -hmm. they're, they're largely ignored. I mean, and the bureaucrats also, stay the same. Yeah, the bureaucrats the, for them they're just pictures on the wall. That's uh, right. You know? <laughs> it's really a danger. It's a very dangerous thing, and I I don't think people. I always on the show, especially, I bring up the administrative state a lot. It's a very dangerous thing. Um, and, and, and not enough people talk. People will complain all the time about bureaucrats, but I never see anybody take an active stance about doing something about it. I don't see politicians pitching it as something to run against. Um, so I don't, I, I really don't, and you, and you see Congress delegating all this power. Um, the judiciary's taking so much power. Well, that's the power. thing. They don't really want, the elected politicians don't want the, don't want the power and they don't want the responsibility. Right. I mean, right. because their job. I mean, look, what are politicians like good at? Like, what's it? Why do they get up in the morning? What What are their specialty? What are their yeah. What's their specialization? They're good at running and getting elected mm -hmm. campaigns. And, yeah. and, and that's that's what they specialize in. Mm -hmm. They're not They're not very good at, at running uh, right. government. So they sort of outsource the management of the state, you know, to these career bureaucrats who've been running right. the world for like a hundred years now. No, you're right. It's a big problem. And and do you notice that most people don't like you mentioned this, but uh, like on the show, but like like most people have no clue about this. I mean, that's just, incredible. It's weird. And like in the American election system, we we all proceed as if you know we're going to elect some personality or a person with values and a vision, and the whole system is going to reset itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And 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 we're gonna have like we're gonna wake up the morning after the inauguration and everything's like exactly. a blank slate and the whole country is gonna re be remade according right. to the vision of this new guy. It's it's weird. Why do we believe this stuff? And yet people do. That's like they believe the demagoguery mainly. I you know this populism that I'm gonna make everything better. I'm you know look for me the 21st. I hear Rubio 21st century 21st. Everything's a mantra. Well, you know what I mean? Why can't somebody come out and eluc elucidate principles of the free market or liberty? And come out and say, "Look, there's not much I can do other than get the government off your back." Right. You know what I mean? You people do it. I'm I'm occupying an office that you gave me to to pull the government off your back. I, I'm waiting for somebody to say that. We um, need Coolidge. We need Coolidge for yeah, that. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I want to go to the next segue here, and then I want to. Grant has some questions about uh, you, yeah. you on anarcho capitalism. I want to get into Bitcoin. This is really interesting to me. I fa I mean, I think as a as a as a feasible solution to the Fed is competing currency. Um, I like the idea of Bitcoin. I want to know more about it. And my first question is, the first important question is, how is the how is the quantity regulated? I heard something that there's a program that limits the amount of Bitcoin to only 21 million Bitcoins and no more can be made. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. It's a weird thing. Uh, what cryptography and open source uh, distributed networks like Bitcoin have done is, 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 is kind of miraculous. They've taken this... This world of, of of the the digital world, which is specializes in making copies of things, yes, uh, basically hacked it uh, to the point that um, they've created a kind of artificial scarcity by use of a of an algorithmic uh, protocol that's that's embedded in the structural ledger itself. Mm -hmm. So there's only a certain number of Bitcoin that can be created. Um, you know, at, at any one time, and I think right now it's about 50 every 10 minutes or something like that. Okay. Uh, so so it's about half the, the rate of creation as it was, you know, when it, when it, when it first opened. Is there any uh, truth to that there's a, one, there's a set limit that I, I, I could have sworn I heard that there's an absolute set limit that no more can be made? Yeah, that was, that's true. That was, no, that's the way Satoshi set it up. He, 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 he fashioned the whole thing as a kind of a, 
a digital gold standard uh, where you okay. imagine a certain amount of gold in the world. Now, not all cryptocurrencies are set that way. I think um, uh, Dogecoin has an infinite inflation rate, and so does um, so do several other coins. They have a okay like unto infinity. But but even then, it doesn't mean that. So it's it's interesting to me because. Uh, I would, as an old-time gold standard advocate, thought that the Bitcoin protocol would be the best one. So you have a, an upward limit and it stops. Right. Um, but I think ultimately we have to let the market to decide. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't. But what matters is that however much new currency is created is is open source and everybody knows what's going on all the time. Right. There's no secrets. Like you think about the difference between the Bitcoin protocol and the Federal Reserve. I mean, the Federal Reserve can't even count the number of dollars that are out there. They keep right. manufacturing new theories. It was in one, two, three, four, five, and you know, uh, MZM and MZM adjusted for this and that. Like, nobody knows how many dollars there are. Right. But we always know exactly. What are the, um, what are the estimates? One point one trillion dollars. I think I saw last was twenty ten or something I, with the numbers. There's got to be more than that. I don't oh, know. Way more than that. And how much exists? Digi how much money di exists digitally? Really? Um, yeah, ninety-nine percent of it. Yeah, I know. How much? And how much is that at this point? God, well, nobody even knows. And it's and there's arguments right. endlessly about what is money and what isn't money. In the age of fiat money, there's no more. Uh, there's no way to distinguish between money and money substitutes. Right. I mean, you think about like the nineteenth century. Um, you know, money was was considered to be gold or silver, and then anything right. that was paper uh, was a was a. No. A, a, yeah, money substitute. It was right. something you turn in in order to get money, and then you had debt instruments, which were a promise to pay. Right. So it's very clean. Right. But ever since, uh, ever since two great things happened, right? The elimination of of money, which was the gold standard, and the age of fiat money, which is basically turning money substitutes into right. money. And, and then you had like, financial deregulation in the early 1980s, and then you know the whole system just blew up, and now nobody even knows anymore. Mm -hmm. That's my point too. Bitcoin again is a fiat currency. It's trading against products and services, right? Or Bitcoin now is trading against the dollar mainly, right? Uh, Bitcoin trades against every currency in the world, and that's one of the things that's really cool about it, is that it really is a global currency. Okay. Um, and that's that's amazing. It knows no nation state, you know, just because. Right. I mean, in fact, we don't even know what country it originated in. It could have been the United States. It doesn't even matter. It's, it's borderless, essentially. So, so do you think the cryptocurrencies, insofar as they're competing currencies, limit the transaction costs? I, what Friedman and Hayek got into a debate over was network effects. Um, transaction costs, how large of a network is going to be using said currency. Do you think, I mean, I see people now with their phone walking into a Starbucks and, you know, hitting a... Uh, yeah. So do you think like that would mitigate the cost of as it was, as was a problem 30 40 years ago of network effects um, with crypt, with competing cri cryptocurrencies well you know I mean? any new innovation I don't care if it's in money or, or video players or, or large screen televisions or computers or shoes or anything the new product can't just be a little bit better it's got to be a lot better you know in order to get people to switch uh, or at least to try it out right. And so there's a big debate about that within this whole uh, community of cryptocurrency. Is you know are the network effects so strong in a prevailing national currencies that mm -hmm. um, cryptocurrency doesn't stand a chance, or or does cryptocurrency because of its very low transactions cost security? Right. You know, I, today on the phone, I got I, I I found out you know my credit card company called and said that somebody stole my credit card number. Right, and they're using it in Florida. I'm not in Florida. They're using it in Florida. I mean, this can't happen with Bitcoin. Right. right. So, the elimination exactly. of the fraud risk, you know, there's a lot of advantages. Whether it's enough under prevailing conditions to to cause the switch, I d it's hard to say. Well, that's the beauty of the market. Something yeah. else comes out that fills those gaps yeah. in a competing currency. But, you know it, I mean? can you imagine, but can you imagine under a dollar crisis what would happen? I mean, that's what I'm interested right. in. Right, that's true, when, yeah. When the next exactly. 2008 comes along, uh, how much of a boost is crypto going to get under those conditions? It's going right. to be interesting to watch. I mean, is is Bitcoin the new the new safe haven? Is it the new gold? Um, I I've, I tend to think that it, that it's a strong competitor in any case. Do you think it's a, a strong competitor to gold? Something as tangible as gold? Yeah, I do. I think it might be the new gold. Yeah. Okay, Grant. Uh, do you have any questions on Bitcoin? I know you were curious too. Yeah, uh, my question on Bitcoin is how is its value established? Is it is it intrinsic in the sense or no nothing really has intrinsic value but is it is the value established? Yeah. What is the source of the value? I mean, it's a good question, right? 
I mean, like, wh where the hell does the money with this the, this uh, digital money get its value? Because it doesn't even really exist in a tangible firm. Um, it took me uh, like a couple of years to figure this out, and uh, I finally realized the source of it is the is the payment network itself. It's the blockchain, which allows. Uh, it's a beautiful technology. It's a, a ledger that exists, you know, on 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 an open source distributed network that allows you to commodify, title, and bundle up any information bits and port them through the network peer to peer in a way that's non forgeable, non reproducible, and essentially immortal. So you're buying security, right? But but, but 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 you're buying a technology, right? And but which the is dollar, secure. historically, the dollar. If you're gold, I assume you know, your error. I assume you're a gold standard guy. So if if the dollar is at the gold standard, that means your your dollar bill is backed by the value of gold. Well, what is Bitcoin backed by? I'm, and I'm not saying it has no value. It's backed by the blockchain. Right. I mean, uh, it's black. No, it's, black it's blocked by numbers in space or numbers in no, the cyber it's, world. It, it, it's backed by the service. That's a communication technology that allows you to commodify information bits and port them on a geographically non-contiguous basis. I mean, it's it's it allows you to transfer value peer to peer from one person to any other person in the world instantly and almost as you. The value is in the value is in the service. So it's strictly reputational value, basically. Well, a service. The value, yeah, the value traces to capacity to do this thing that previously we hadn't been able to do. It fills uh, the gaps of where the problem were of money, of tangible money. It, it's what it does is people will use it because it's easier to transfer from one person's wallet to another. It kind of fills those gaps in yeah. tra transfer and, costs and so and on. And Grant, I mean, just to kind of look, I mean, look, this, this is a different. This, these are complicated issues, right? And, mm -hmm. and and it took me a long time to think this through. But if you look at the history of Bitcoin, it came out in in early January of 2009, and for for fully 10 months, it has zero value whatsoever. So it started, you know, like this. Um, you know, it was uh, completely worthless. So what was happening over those ten months that caused it to obtain value? Uh, what what was happening is that people were banging on the network and trying it out and trying to see if it actually did work. Uh, if if the communications technology of the blockchain itself did accomplish its goals to overcome what mathematicians call the, the um, Byzantine generals problem, and and it did work. It's, it's the first technology in history that we've ever had that accomplishes this weird thing of being able to port non-forgeable uh, information com commodities peer-to-peer -peer anywhere in the world over a single network instantly at zero cost. So, and, and that's not just useful for money, but it's useful for, for all kinds of c contracting. Um, any kind of business dealings you want to do with another person, you can do through the blockchain, and 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 the blockchain was was that kind of innovation. Even aside from Bitcoin, right? It just so happens that Bitcoin is the thing that makes transactions on the blockchain realizable. Um, but it's the it's the blockchain itself that's the, that's the source of the value. And I know that sounds a little bit abstract, but I'm I'm just that's 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 the answer to the question you're asking, which is a totally valid question. It's an important yeah. one from the point of view of the Austrian school. Yeah, it's kind of always kind of always struck me as more of a of a fad currency, and I see the idea of where the value comes from, and, and maybe that will hold up in the short term, as we've seen firms like Overstock now accepts it. But but as far as is it sustainable, I don't think I'm totally sold on that yet. Uh, um, but I. I Love the idea of competing currencies. Well, totally. but, you but know, I, it's Grant, from Bitcoin specifically, I'm not totally sold yet. I I, I can't get that. And and there's anybody who can tell you, anybody who tells you that they're sure is right. is not telling not telling the truth. I mean, um, it because you know the blockchain technology itself is an open source technology, and and every cryptocurrency and there are now tens of thousands of them each use a separate blockchain. Um, but there are many technologies that can use the blockchain, and many different currencies that can use the blockchain. Anything that can use this this ledger, this it's a combination of cryptography and the open source ledger um, that that is the great uh, epic innovation. And what that turns into in the future is, I think, uh, a little bit unclear. But but I I was just writing an article today that the age of the the point at which we're Incredulous about the possibility of a digital money, I think, has already passed us. You know, um, right. we we now know that that something like this is possible, and that's kind of epic. 
I like I like Bitcoin. I mean, I I, yeah. Do I see pro- I see problems uh, too? I, I mean, but I think it's a great idea, and I think yeah, competing currencies is, is certainly the answer to the Federal Reserve. Well, who can, who can, who can believe this? I mean, you know, I I totally exactly. get, like everybody's like, what the hell? You know, you're gonna make up an in, a, a, a money on the internet, and the world's gonna accept it. How's that gonna happen? You know. Right. I, and when I first encountered uh, Bitcoin, that was exactly my reaction. I was like. Uh, this, this, uh, whoever's whoever's promoting this crap is 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 either a fool or you know right. a con artist. You know. Right. I mean, my problem again is the network effects. If I have Bitcoin, I can't go use it. I know Subway. I, I they took it. I don't know if they still do, but if I'm walking down the street and I need to get something, I, and I'm poor. So if my money's in Bitcoin, there's a certain access to money I don't have certain you places. See that broke ass lamp in the background. Yeah, I know. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, I found this mirror in the alleyway here. I have Sinatra. I have Sinatra over here. <laughs> I have Sinatra over here. Your house is terrible. It's awful. <laughs> Shut up, Grant. Yeah, anyway. I don't see no brothers on the wall. Where are your brothers on the wall? Yeah, I know, right? They are the, best. <laughs> they are the greatest entertainers of all time, even the market. <laughs> um, I wanted to move along. And this is an important question, and I know a lot of uh, libertarians online want to hear about this, is the differences and the similarities between Rand Paul and Gary Johnson. Um... There's a lot of libertarian purists out there, okay, who won't bend, who won't bend on anything. Um, it has to be the libertarian party. It can't be Rand. Rand compromised here. Rand compromised there. What are your thoughts on that? If you had to vote, and it was a libertarian candidate, Rand Paul versus Gary Johnson, who would you vote for? Well, so I don't really think my vote really matters. So it's, it's just <laughs> no. Well, let's just say, let's say you were the last person. You were the. You, this, it, it went to Congress. You're the senator oh. that decides. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're the vice president. You're the you're the deciding vote in the Senate on who becomes president, and it's get between. Okay. Gary and I, I I think I think in that you know what you know that's a legitimate question, and and I think my answer would have to be Gary Johnson, but not because he has he has the right positions on the right. Right, issue. right, right. It's because he loves to spend most of his time on vacations. Yeah, and, which is great. And like I don't know, skiing and, and and scuba diving, and I don't know all the stuff that he does. And that's my kind of president. There's there's only one problem I have, big problem I have with Rand Paul. He seems a little bit too earnest to me. Yeah, I agree in the two yeah. sense. Yeah, and, and and I worry about people that are overly earnest holding public office. But you have to. He has to act enthused. He has to seem earnest, like he wants it. There's just so many things in a campaign that they have to consider. And if you're if you're aloof, uh, that's a big problem. I mean, there, you, your media personalities are already going to hammer this guy. The, G, the GOP establishments after him. So I, I I think yes, and I think it can sometimes it can look feigned, like he's trying too hard to put on some sort of an image. Absolutely, and that'll happen with most. I, 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 but I get that to an extent. Um, what do you grant? I, I, what do you think? I mean, if it was up to you, you're a libert. You're more. I mean, I consider myself a libertarian, conservative. I, a constitutionalist. You're more of a libertarian than I am, but in, in so far as it relates to purism. What, if it came down to it, Gary Johnson, and Rand Paul, who would you pick? In well, the same situation as Jeffrey. If if it was a flip of the coin pick, guaranteed winner, I would pick Gary Johnson. Um, but at the same time, I am a moderate libertarian in the real sense of the word. Uh, um, I am going to vote for Rand Paul. I'm not going to vote for Gary Johnson solely because I don't see the point in casting my vote for someone who might get 1% of the vote. Uh, and, and that's not because I'm unprincipled. That's because I, I think this is a uh, one-step battle. This is not a sweeping change. Uh, mm. um, I, I think Gary Johnson has been hypocritical at times. I think he has been inconsistent at times, just as Who a hasn't? politician would right. be. So it's Any like, human being. it's like, Any come on, being. like if we're gonna like throw these labels around, like really, we're just gonna only apply them to people who put an R next to their name. Didn't Ron Paul do that for like how long? Thirty years. So that to me is just it's irrelevant. Just using all these political labels for who does what. Uh, I, I look at the individual. I don't look at their party they're affiliated with. Right, um, absolutely. That's what our system's supposed to be built on is the individual, but parties have a ton of hey, power. If we can't be perfect, let's be abysmal, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I would vote, to let you guys know, I'd vote for Rand Paul over. Sorry. Yeah, you vote for Jeb Bush. <laughs> I'd go Jeb Bush. We need another, you know will save the country? Another Bush. That'll save the market. So Jeb, and then I want every other brother, then I, the granddaughters, I want everybody in there, and that's, I think, the answer to the... Uh, 
to saving the country. But if you wanted to be a yep. real cynic, if you wanted to be a real cynic about politics, you could make an argument like Hillary would be the best president because she'd have immediately arrive in an office with like half the country totally dedicated to to making it impossible for her to do anything. Right. The most, the most hated president in. No, history. that's a good point. That is a good point. I and, and 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 she might like her husband be very good at triangulating. You know, he was always kind of yes. moving, moving right mm -hmm. as a way of kind of buying off his critics. And so he got welfare reform. He repealed right. the fifty dollars speed limit. You know, I mean, he did some good things. He more or less balanced the budget because the economic mm -hmm. boom, lots of revenue coming in. But right. I mean, wasn't the, wasn't the worst president ever actually. Right. You know, in the, no, in he wasn't. He was, I mean, it was built off of really the, the market policies that happened in the 80s, and it was kind of streaming along, and here's a guy, Clinton, that said, oh, the era of big government's over, and now yeah. his wife's coming in there, and she's going to, I mean, George W. Bush really started the era of big government again. I mean, I don't know how many people know that, but this guy exploded de deficits. It was, it's incredible. Medicare Part D. What was the other one that won the education one with this pithy name? Their child left behind. Yeah, yeah, are you kidding me? I mean, I don't. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna get too angry. We need to move on. That's um, right. But, but but in the end, aren't you gonna support Jeb over Hillary Clinton? I mean, tell me the truth. No, I can't. I, I literally, there's no point. I so you'll say, you would, you would, you I just would, won't do it. I. No, I'm but I, I should. I should put it to you like you put it to me. Like you're the last person. If I had to pick, <laughs> I I would have fun with it. I would probably like. I would. What I would do is I'd stand up and I'd run in a circle, like as fastly as fast as I can, and then I'd be really dizzy. And then I would just point in one direction, or try to point in one direction, and that would be who the president was. Because at that point, that's all you're really doing. I mean, I don't... That's how he does it already anyways. The co corporatists would run the country at that point. Whoever, lobbyists, uh, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce, that's another corporatist. But you know what? What causes Republicans to come around to the, to the nominee, no matter who it is in the end, is the fear of the Supreme Court. I mean, that's always yeah, the thing. true. That that drives Republicans in the end, um, and that's such a shame that all that 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 that, that, the, that the Supreme Court has that much power. Yeah, that it influences you know how people act. Here we are hanging by a thread every time the the judges go into their chambers. This is I know this that's is a, a republic. This is I not a republic, it. and that uh, the Supreme Court is awful. I think I should sure. get rid of it. I don't want to go into it. I really don't. I want to move along to Grant's questions. I, yes. I hate the Supreme Court. I hate it. Grant, you had questions specific to anarcho-capitalism. Go you ahead. Anarchist, I have questions for you. <laughs> because I'm, like I said, I'm a moderate libertarian. I call my page is the modern libertarian, so moderate, modern, whatever. So I, I'm thing. fascinated by Rothbard's book, For a New Liberty. It's what really sort of motivated me into the movement. And, and one place where he really just completely lost me was this idea of a privatized court system where as... Parties could dis could basically settle. I mean, I'm sure you've read the book hundreds of times, but you know the chapter I'm talking about on privatized yeah. courts. So, how do you see that translating into a state? Because you'd have to have a stateless, borderless society for that to actually function. No, so how do you I see think, that working? Well, I think I, I'm not entirely sure what your problem is with the with the chapter because I I found it very compelling. Um, you know, one of, one of the things is we do have private courts now. In fact, uh, most employment contracts require that you take any disputes to to an independent arbiter and not go to the government courts. And people try to avoid the government courts as much as possible. We have huge private arbitration in this in this, in this country, and nobody likes the government courts. And uh, it goes for large corporations and you know everybody. So we have an extensive um, uh, private court system as it as it is, but the the one area where I would criticize Murray is I, I think he was overly attached to a, a kind of a universalist view of of law. Like he he thought that there ought to be just sort of one legal standard in the world, and it ought to sort of all trace to sort of libertarian ethics or something like that. I find that um, really uh, unrealistic. Um, and, and I far prefer a, a more of a Hayekian style anarchism, where you see real competition over what the law looks like, not just how the courts uh, function. So that so that the the whole system of law and courts and everything is a, a, an extension of our values as a community and the market experimentation that finds the best possible si system that that uh, can exist. And if that sounds utopian, I don't believe it is no. because. We see this all the time online, right? I mean, like, like Amazon and Overstock and and eBay and you know, 
you know, Uber, you name this, the system of commercial endeavor you have online, they've all generated their own systems of commercial engagement uh, through terms of use contracts and uh, norms, commercial norms that have emerged out of their own business enterprise. They find the rules that seem to make most sense for their sector. Right. And I, I would, I mean, my view of anarchism is you just take that very workable system. It works for all of us every day, Amazon, you name it iTunes, uh, 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 Chrome, and just expand it to the whole society. So you just throw up the whole system. And it's like, okay, guys, figure out a system that works best for you, and uh, we'll go from there. And that, you kind of answered my but, question. But, 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 hold but on, could, Grant, let me get in here one second. Let me get in. I want to challenge him on this point. Yes, in private, like certain contract law, the Coase theorem, would, the Coase theorem generally, which states that in lieu of government intervention, intervention and high transaction costs that people, regardless of property rights or uh, some and and whatever is in a contract, that they would come to a mutually beneficial resolution without government. Um, but but let's look at it, criminal law um, without subpoena power or any sort of coercion for somebody to be restrained, uh, perhaps during a court case or or a witness to be called to the stand. How do you re how does that how would that be rectified? Say in an anarchist state, and I think you, you kind of answered it insofar as it relates to law in different areas and competing laws, but at the same time that kind of sub subjectivizes, that subjectivizes like metaphysical rights, like our axiomatic rights like life, liberty, and property, to a degree. Yeah. Not, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think criminal law poses particular problems for us. I mean, uh, because, for one thing, because the state has so long monopolized the sector that we don't really have a vision of how how would a free society actually deal with things like... Well, like, let, me, let me challenge you there. The Mafia in New York monopolized crime and criminal law for quite a while um, in the South Bronx, in Harlem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they handled it, I, I'd say, efficiently, though I don't yeah. know if there was a lot of justice used. I'm not saying that yeah. the state is entirely, you know, is all yeah. about justice. And, and, and that's have seen it. That's a complicated problem because mostly the mafia, you know, uh, had power due to you know uh, government, you know, and 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 prohibitions, you know, that mm -hmm. they gave them power and revenue. If it hadn't been for the illegalization of drugs and, and liquor and prostitution and and gambling, uh, there probably wouldn't have ever been a, a, a mafia to begin with. Although right. again, that's that's speculation. Um, so those would exist. Those could have exist in an anarchist society as well, using the they, same. They could, you know. I it's it's like you know. I and and let me go back to this problem of of murder and, and criminal punishments and stuff in a in a pur purely free society. Um, I I don't. It's hard for me to know. You know, like I can't say for sure how things would work. The, the only thing that that really seriously troubles me about the way it, the current system is that there's absolutely no experimentation. Or concern for compensating victims of crimes, and or rehabilitation, or making just making everybody better off. I mean, it's just like it's like an utterly cruel system. Right, it's rec no rectification. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, and it doesn't. It doesn't care about victims. It doesn't care right. about anything or anybody. It's like everybody's losing in the current system. And I, I think if you throw open a system like that to to the social order, not to state, and right. say. You know, let's come up with a system that's uh, that's workable. We right. at least have a chance to kind of experiment and, a little bit. Right, and let me. The part of the problem is, I'm sorry, Grant, I'll get you in here. But part of the problem is jurisprudence, and certainly in criminal law, it's been jurisprudence. Is the federal government has taken more power away from states and localities, and so far as it relates even to criminal law. Um, I know courts with Miranda rights and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I'm not saying that those are bad, but I'm saying that the way. They they have centralized a lot of the into like a, a federal police state almost where it's almost unified over all the states and there aren't yeah. competing criminal it's hard laws to imagine and criminal that, procedures. That things could be worse, really. I mean, I, I look at the way private courts now treat people, and there's always a concern for the victims. That's like the number one concern, mm -hmm. and then a concern for not you know not being excessively cruel or, or doing absurd things that that don't help so, the social. Order. I mean, you go into any courtroom in this country, you know, any county courthouse, and look at the people lined up in criminal court now, and you're like, what the hell are you people? What are you do? What is what is this judge doing? I mean, he's just out to ruin people's lives. I mean. It's, like, uh, like everybody's being harmed through the system as it currently exists, and I can't believe that in a in a pure society, a purely free society, we would have systems like that. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that courts would work very much like uh, markets for everything else, you know, tennis mm -hmm. shoes or 
computers or software or, or anything. Just the problem would be with coercion. The problem would be to coerce somebody to show up or subpoena power or to coerce, say, a criminal, somebody who could be perhaps mentally insane that's, that, that is a, uh, a public threat is kind of where, what, where that kind of loses me, how that would be, those problems would be mitigated in an anarchist society. I don't know. Grant, was did you have a point, too, to that? I think that yeah. was... Okay, so, all right, so, Go ahead. like, to what Will said, su subpoena power, bring it, being able to force somebody to show up to court, but what my, what I, what I see as, is it's, let's say, in an anarchist society, if someone, and I'm just going to say a poor person, not to invoke some sort of a, a, a narrative, but someone who cannot afford to purchase the power of the court, let's say, to subpoena somebody for their grievance, uh, how does that social cost fall on everybody else? And I, and I think from an economic standpoint, it, it's worth mentioning that, let's say, the taxes that we pay to fund the criminal court in that regard yep. far are far less than the benefits they provide whether or not they operate functionally now is, to me, besides the point, but in a sort of, where I see it, ideal way, uh, um, the, the, the benefits outweigh the cost. But, but again, that involves a co co uh, coercive taxation to fund this, which is against an anarchist society. So how would, how would uh, uh, if I make, you know, if, if I'm a low-income person, how would I bring my grievance to the court? Um, yeah, I assume that there would be a lot of subscription plans, as we see right now in, in uh, the market for, for security as it, as, as it currently exists, and insurance plans too, right? Where So insurance agencies are, are, are all about catching perpetrators. I mean, if my house burns down, you know, and, I, and it's insured, you know, it's not going to be the police that are going to be looking for the, per, for the perpetrators. Insurance. It's going to be the insurance company. Right. You know? They're going to hunt people down. And uh, as far as the subpoena power, I... I don't know. I mean, that's that's kind of a tricky subject, and I'm not entirely sure I have an answer to that. Except that I, I will say that you know markets are really good at isolating and excluding and uh, uh, you know pulling people out of the stream of life without coercion. I mean, I, I became very aware of this recently when I when I just recently moved uh, to Atlanta, and realized that if I hadn't had a decent credit rating, you know, I probably wouldn't be able to have electricity on in my house right now. You know, it's pretty <laughs> grim. Um, and as as for the as for the poor, you know, I think one of the great problems we have in our system right now is most people think that the poor are well taken care of. They are not well taken care of. The state doesn't give a shit about the poor. No, they don't. No, they don't. And and. and you know, it's what I what I like about these kinds of Q and A sessions we're having right now, is that what it illustrates is these kind of concerns that you have for the for the poor are kind of universal concerns. And if right. they are universal concerns, there's going to be a rise of a human of a community that's con that is very interested in addressing them. The, the, and, the problem with that point, though, is a lot of people abdicate their personal duty to poor people to the state. I don't and, and and I don't know if they do it That's because right. they want the state to grow or is it they don't want to feel that personal responsibility on themselves. Oh, I pay my taxes. I don't need to donate to this company yeah. or donate my time. I don't I can't figure I know why the politicians do it, okay? They don't care they don't give a shit about the poor. They care about their own power and their own self aggrandizement. But I don't understand why people would say, Well, let's help the poor, so let's vote to get those fat cats and take their money. I well, I don't understand that. I don't I, I that that's where I'm lost. Uh, and you're right about the universal plight of people that care about the poor. But where has it gone wrong? Yeah. I mean, I think you know, there's other problems in the anarchist society that people are confronting with, like what would happen with nuclear weapons, right? Right. Uh, that's a. But you know, here again, I th I think if you like poll the whole of humanity and say like, what is one of the biggest problems that exists in the world? Uh, people would say, well, nuclear weapons, those things are freaking evil, right? And yeah. I could totally imagine really effective private systems that would emerge that would actually hunt down. Anybody who's uh, building nuclear weapons and 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 bring about certain forms of massive social isolation and uh, 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 exclusion, mm -hmm. uh, and that would develop a, a kind of a global consensus. I think to consider these people to be complete criminals. Go ahead, Grant. All right. So here's my question: Would people voluntarily pay? for services to hunt down other people who have nuclear weapons. Like, do you think that your neighbor 
your two neighbors would pay voluntarily to find people around the globe who have nuclear weapons with malicious intent. Well, I th they may not pay, but uh, there are plenty of people that would be willing to do that. I mean, in the same sense that, like, if you look at the way the very rich uh, spend their money now, I mean, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, if you ask me 20 years ago, uh, is, is there going to be anybody wealthy enough to provide condoms for all of Africa? Uh, I would have said, no, that's, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody want to do such a thing? And yet that's exactly what's going on. I mean, human people, the, ri ver the very rich are very attracted to humanitarian causes. And uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons from this earth is probably the number one most compelling humanitarian cause. I can see... Well, you know, as I thought about this, I realized something. The only reason we have nuclear weapons in the world today is because of states. I mean, if there weren't states, they'd, they'd have to be eliminated. I just can't believe that, that they would exist. To, to Grant's point, though, that was a good point at the free rider problem insofar as it relates to defense and things like that, collective issues that a lot of people may not take up. But you, yeah, I, to me, these are kind of the kind of problems like intellectuals invent and economists yeah. invent but that, the, that people, when left to their own devices, are going to figure out a way to solve them. Yeah, okay. Um, gosh, I forgot what the, I wanted to move on to here. I just blanked out. I was thinking of, oh, this is what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> I, I run social media sites. Grant does, too. You're, you're very eloquently spoken. You write well, and you advocate anarcho-capitalism, but you do so in an amenable way. You're not vitriolic. Um, you know, I, I, I know I encounter a lot of Rothbardian anarchists specifically, and I mean, I had leftists attack my page, not to the, not to the extent that anarcho-capitalists do. I'm just wondering. I don't. I'm not. I, I don't know why they hate me so much. I don't know if they hate you though. No, I don't know if they hate you or not. They just. They, I mean, and I know that my the, my contemporaries that we are capitalists, my friends, yeah. they get a lot of this too, and we're advocating capitalism, free markets, and it's hey, never. Look. I've been I've been subject to, subjected to unbelievable. I'm sure you have. I'm from sure. The same people. I mean, you know, I mean, there are trolls in the world, and it just so happens that a lot of them like to support the anarcho-capitalist label. As a matter of fact, I was talking about this tonight because I have an anarchist meetup here in, in, in Atlanta that I go to every week, and we we were talking about how uh, how strangely anarcho-capitalism is becoming sort of oddly unfashionable among young people, and I think a lot of the reason for that is. Is nothing to do with intellectual uh, issues. I think it's just that, a, a, that so many anarcho capitalists are just are just such jerks <laughs> <laughs> that people don't want to have anything to do with them. I, I hate to say that because they're sort of right. my tribe, you know. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Is it intellectual insecurity or something? I'm not sure. When I first when I first heard, you know when I first heard of it, I read Rothbard before I heard of anarcho capitalists online, and I was very sympathetic. I'm like, man, you know, I wish this could work. I hate the government sucks. And these, they, it was just, whatever I would post, they would just hammer me, my inbox. <laughs> if they found my email, if they found, you know what I mean, whatever I, I, I was. And I it was very crazy. persistent. Yeah. Right, and it made me start to hate them and hate, and it was I, like, I, I almost start to hate the idea now. It's just like I hear the same mantras, and, but the thing, that, what I always admired about you was I never heard the same kind of stuff. I, I hear it a lot from Woods, too. Tom Woods does it. It's, I'd never really hear you engage in that, which I think is very important for the anarcho-capitalist movement, and, 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 and in general, in a broader sense, limiting government. Do you know what I mean? I think that's yeah. what we all want to do here. Yeah, yeah. I, do you I know? want to limit government in any way possible, however incremental. I don't want to call people names. I, I, I'd rather research and read and, and, and destroy statist arguments rather yeah. than go at people or call so the people names. I think a lot of it really traces to a certain amount of intellectual insecurity. Correct, um, yes, I agree. People jump on a certain sort of doctrine and they, they drive it all the way to its most extreme conclusion. And they find themselves out on a ledge and instead of uh, feeling right. a sense of security, and uh, being willing to entertain objections, that sort of thing, they, they fight bitterly, you know, they act like cornered rats all the time. Um, I think it's, a, it's, it's just really a reflection of the fact that they haven't done enough study. And right. they have, a, like, a sense that maybe what they believe is true. But I agree. They're not agree. entirely sure, you know, how to get there or how to deal with opposition-style arguments, really. Right. And a, uh, lot of the, and a lot of the young anarchists that I meet haven't really even read Rothbard. Haven't, they uh, don't... You know, or they espouse Bastiat or Mises, and I—they've never really read them. Yeah. I say, "Oh, have you read Menger? Who's that?" And no. I'm starting to be like, "Yeah, you know, come on here." Yeah, no, it's a, it's a meme culture of learning that's going on. You know, yeah. <laughs> something on Facebook, and they go, "Yeah, that's what I believe." I mean, 
I, 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 sort of take, I, I sort of I take these people apart. I wrote an article about you know, a little more than a year ago called "Against Libertarian Brutalism." That yes, I read that. That was yeah, great. It, it attempts to sort of uh, deal with some of this stuff. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying the brutalists aren't libertarians. I'm just saying that they're they, they haven't matured enough intellectually. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I like to think of it. You know, they're bullies instead of black belts. You know, I mean, like right. if got a black belt, they're they're, they're the coolest, calmest people ever. They don't seem threatened at all. That's right? a great point. That's a great you know, point. You know, they're just they're just, they're ready to take on you know any arguments, any any issues, and they're friendly and everything. It's nice, but when there's a threat, then they can you know win instantly, right? right? But I a bully is from that page. always <laughs> having. You know, but a bully is always having to you know, like show off all the time and shout people down. You were banned from Libertarian Brutalism page, Grant? Yeah, I was. <laughs> um, that's got to take a lot to get. Well, yeah, actually, not really. It really hurt my feelings. I mean, um, I wasn't even invited, so. You know, was, <laughs> no, that was a great article. I read that. Um, before, Grant, do you have anything to ask uh, Jeffrey, too? Yeah, uh, okay. So, one thing, one last thing that's always got me about anarchic capitalism borderless society. Now I'm all for I'm all for open borders. I'm all for immigration, uh, automation. The more robots and the immigrants we have, the happier I am. But what I don't see happening is a seamless transition of uh, of Mexico to America, of Ukraine to Russia, and that's what a lot of anarcho-capitalists are essentially advocating for: is a stateless, borderless society. So how do you see? If tomorrow was a stateless, borderless society, how do you see that working out in the sense of Ukraine and Russia, uh, uh, of, um, I mean, the Middle East? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you know the answer to this question. I mean, uh, most of the world conflicts over borders really trace to states themselves. I mean, that's, that's the problem. It's not really about the people. Um, this, but but does it, doesn't it not translate to people at this point? Yeah, it does. Yeah, sure, because people feel a profound sense of nationalism, um, and that that nationalism gives gives fuel to states that want to use conflicts to to heighten their own power, whether it's uh, Ukraine or or, or or Russia. You know, when you talk about borders, I oftentimes think about what how Europe worked before the advent of the nation state, say between uh, the 11th century and about um, <coughs> really as late as the 18th century. Um, there were no absolutely no border controls, no immigration controls uh, whatsoever. States were tiny. You know, Germany didn't exist, France didn't exist, Italy didn't exist. Um, everything was these little micro units, and and people freely traveled from place to place. That didn't mean that people didn't have identities. They did. They have different languages, different right. identities, different attachments to the land, a different set of history, religion. There's many things that can define us, right? But what yeah. did not define the typical European for that you know beautiful stretch of 500 years was the attachment to some gigantic nation state. That did not exist and people were very amazing. They could reinvent themselves, you know, depending on where they happened to be living or working at the time. They would learn a new language and even change the spelling of the names, you know. Uh, inter intermarriage between territories kept, kept the peace. It was a much more peaceful environment. And then, and then suddenly, you know, we invented this thing called the nation state, and then everybody's like this, and and suddenly, Italy is at, at at war with France, and France hates England, and England hates Germany, and you know. The challenge, your point, Jeffrey, though, a lot of it isn't just nation states. A lot of it's culture, and a lot of that existed before there were nation states, before there were borders. If you look yeah. at multiculturalism, has mm -hmm. been a problem throughout history within borders, outside of borders. If you look at, I think it was Holland, who was largely a market, a trading economy, very tolerant um, in Europe. Uh, it was created around 1200 AD. Um, they had problems with multiculturalism there insofar as it relates to their trade and protecting their business. And I think it was the Anabaptists that came in that were ex they were nutty, extremely intolerant, things like and Yeah. Uh, you know, where the Anabaptists cause trouble everywhere they go. No, right? but I mean, it was this advent of just to use them as a <laughs> just to use them as a as an example. The early Anabaptists, I mean, you yeah. know, they were just taking I know, their clothes off, running yeah. in the streets. Um, but there was problems with multiculturalism in city states, and I think a lot of that, a lot of it, still today, irrespective of borders, is entirely cultural. Um, how uh, the, the government, and and I think sometimes to a degree, and not always, that the governments reflect said culture. So there's huge problems. If you were to say, I, you know what I mean? Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I, I do. But, you know, and I, I don't want to dispute that what you're saying is right. I mean, there, there are natural conflicts between 
between people, cultures, races, sexes, religions. I mean, right. there's a million ways you can slice and dice the population. But if you can develop a vibrant commercial culture, and that's what we all want. I mean, the right. birth exactly. of exactly in a perfect world, I agree. Yeah, but look, if you want to see how it works, you don't have to go far. Like, go go to vacation in Miami. All right, for example, just for. Mm -hmm for a weekend and check it out. I mean, you'll see the most unbelievable mosaic of, of differences among people. And Look at yet, Queens. I, Go to Queens, man. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so I, I, I haven't been to Queens. I don't know. No, but it, You know, it's beautiful the way commerce brings people together. And the more and, and what is commerce? It isn't just something we do on the offside just because we want to or whatever. No, commerce is the way we live. I mean, it's the right. thing that provides the material goods that makes our lives better. And the market and, and, creates those incentives to work together irrespective does. of culture, I agree. But not every culture that will acquiesce to a market structure is the problem. There's been cultures that are still pre-enlightenment. I mean, they really haven't reached the enlightenment. They don't. They're, they lack the civil society, which is essential for a marketplace. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but so often, you know, you look like a country, look at a country like Turkey, right? I mean, once, once it's sort of modernized and, and got a modern commercial marketplace, you know, uh, I mean, Islamic uh, extremism just basically didn't, you know, stopped existing. I agree, but Erdogan started to rip, Erdogan started to tear that apart as soon as he got into office, too. There's still, there's that, and you're right, though, you're right, there is that, there's a real struggle there in Turkey specifically for a, a push against civil society and radical statism. Um, there, in, there is, but where, where, the com where the commercial sector exists, what you see is a robust and very beautiful and inspiring sort of facial yeah. Islam yes. combined with, you know, a love of getting along. And Jordan, too, to an extent. Yeah. Jordan, in the same sense, has, yeah. I mean... It's, it's just true. Where you find commerce, you find peace. And where you put up barriers to trade... I couldn't you know, agree more. That's where you're going to you're gonna exacerbate the tensions that, that exist between people anyway. So I'm not saying we can solve, like, all problems. Right. But, but you, you, you have the best chance of creating a peaceful human community uh, when you have a, a, a free trade and good enforcement of property rights and lots of commercial engagement. Right, you're right. People are that's fallible by their nature. That's, yeah. that, that's just beautiful to me. I mean, just I, I get so excited when I go to like a really heterogeneous community and see everybody right. getting along through trade. It's like people don't even know each other. Like if that trade didn't exist, they'd probably hate each other's guts. They'd find a million reasons to hate each other. But because of the presence of commerce, you mm -hmm. know, they, they figure out ways to, 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 to find value in each other. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Right. That's what we should all do. And that's how you make a society, is I by agree. finding value in other people. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I, I mean, the market structure, there's nothing more beautiful in the world than the yeah. market structure and how you know, people work together in the market structure. Um, it acts as a check on political power markets. It um, does, and it changes people. It can change people instantly, just right. if you don't mind telling a quick Go story. Um, I was at a, a, an event that really had this huge effect on me. I was at the Los Angeles airport, and I think I was flying off to Australia or Brazil. I don't know where I was. But it, in the international terminal, and we were all in a very tight, closed quarters, and there was a, a blaring fluorescent lights above us, low ceiling, very tight lines, and people from all over the world. And we were all, and speaking all these different languages, we were all getting on each other's nerves. I mean, I didn't like the person in front of me, <laughs> behind me. They didn't like me. Everybody smelled funny to me. I probably smelled funny to them. You know, all these wacko languages going on. I'm thinking, fuck, you know, what is this world? You know, this is just a loathsome environment. And everybody's testy. Nobody, and it's just like this teeming mass of like, it was like a conservative nightmare, you know, of multiculturalism. This is what it looks like, you know. <laughs> Uh, it was like it was about to explode, right? And and we got through, so I don't know what they were doing, checking passports, I don't know what they were doing. But once we got past the government official, we opened up this door, and then we went into the international, the privately owned section of the same international terminal. And there were beautiful lights, and there was music playing, there's this, this commercial culture going on all over the place. And and it seemed like a, like a u utopia of universal peace and happiness. <laughs> And, and after about 15 minutes, I suddenly, it dawned on me, I thought, my God, this culture that I'm in right now is built from the same people that were just in that line on the other side of that door 10 minutes ago, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it makes you realize just how powerful institutions are in terms of incentivizing us to, yeah. to get along. Oh, it was, I agree. To me, it was, a, it was a, like a mind-blowing experience because what seemed like intractable 
conflicts between cultures just vanished, you know, in a flash, solely because of the difference between th this side of the door versus that side of the door, because they're different institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the incentives created are, are incredible in, in, in a market and in, in institutions like that. I agree. Um, before we go, you have a book out. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, bit by bit. Yes, bit by bit. Yeah. That's on Bitcoin. It's on peer-to-peer -peer technology generally, and and okay. how I think it's fundamentally changing the structure of, of capitalism, actually. Okay, and yeah. you had a pro and a book previous to that too, right? Yeah, it's called uh, Freedom is the Do-It-Yourself Project. Yes, okay. Um, and that's my biggest book, and right. I think it's Good book. probably my, my best, and it's the least read. So. <laughs> okay, and how but, often do you come? You write a lot. How often do you come out with your pieces? Uh, I try to write every day. Um, I wow. don't know. Always succeed, um, but yeah, I got a lot of stuff coming out. Uh, you know, Fee's publishing a lot of my work now. Liberty Me's publishing. Right, I see it everywhere. How do you get? How do you? How do you not run out of ideas? Uh, well, um, <laughs> I, I don't run out of ideas because I write. In other words, I write so that I can get rid of my existing ideas in order that I can have more. I to mean, get it's more like, in there. Yeah, it's like I have a. It's like I have, that's. It's a pathology. Like I have to right. get it out every day. Right. So that, New stuff can come in to me, so right. Okay. So you just purge and fill and purge and fill, and it works. Yeah. And how and how's everything going at Liberty Me? Everything's going really well. We've been open now a year, and yes. as as you know, it's a very vibrant and and wonderful community. I'm just so thrilled that it serves so many, so many writers that people have never heard of now have new platforms. Yep. And 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 people that that were uh, lonely have new friendships. You know. So. No, I agree. It's a great uh, platform that rivals. I think it's a great platform and a beginning to rival Facebook in a sense. I I hope so, but I I want to be more than that. I really want to be a, a place that inspires people to you know sort of. Try out their, their try their hand at literature, yeah. and get serious about ideas, right? So we distribute like 250 books and and all sorts of guides, and I'm I'm trying to provide a kind of a pa positive pathway towards uh, finding ways to be freer without just you know doing the brutalist thing all the time, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's other ways to to, to make a, make the world a better place besides denouncing people on Facebook. Exactly. There's also another thing that I just want to give you a piece of advice. Do nev never let Grant ever post his stuff on Liberty Me. I mean, this stuff is it's like it looks like a third grade wrote it with a crayon. It, oh. It's really no, okay, he writes good stuff. Probably, probably be my favorite stuff if that's true. No. <laughs> I, I, I am I am so Will can't read it doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever Will says doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love, it's I pictures. I don't know. Article on Liberty Got Me. I mean, I love waking up in the morning and seeing what people have written overnight. I just, I just how many bloggers it. are there? Uh, God, by this time, I, we probably have as many as uh, I think probably about a third of the people have made their own uh, publishing sites. You know, and everybody's able able to, but not everybody does. So we might have as many as fifteen hundred. Oh wow, like that. that's wow. a lot. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of articles. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, very cool. A lot of content, and and it's wonderful. It's been great for traffic, and I think I think we've had a big effect um, on the intellectual world and and the activist world too. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm yeah, I can't be happy. I'm I'm very pleased with it. Okay, and you, you, I mean, where do you see Liberty Me going in the future specifically? Like, uh, do you want to grow the platform? Um, I do. do. You, do you I, see I, it I as social media? For, Go ahead. I, yeah, I, I'm always looking for new ideas to enhance the technology, and we've gone through such unbelievable. Uh, development and upheaval over the last 12 months, I and mean, it's just been so relentless. But right now, we're 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 kind of trying to let things stabilize for for a few months, and then and then we're going to see what what it is that consumers like, and uh, build those things out, and see the parts that are not used, and appreciate those, and and keep trying to perfect it and get better and better at what we're doing. And you know what's great about this show is we don't know how to make it not be live anymore, so we're all going to be together. Okay, <laughs> till the end of the. Yes, no, I, I just got to press the red button for whatever reason. I've been made master of the universe here, so I don't, I don't know. Well, let's just part, let's just be grateful that it's not Grant because we'd all be screwed. <laughs> yeah, burn that shit down, <laughs> gentlemen. Well, I really enjoyed hanging out with you so much tonight. Hey, thank yeah, you. What's in the, you have time. a show. You have a sh weekly show too, right, Jeffrey? Oh, I don't know. It seems like I'm doing this almost, you know, a couple of, you know, several nights. Or a, a week. podcast? Is it a podcast that you have? I'm yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to do podcasts more. Okay. Uh, I probably do. You're probably right. It's hard for me to keep right. up. Right. You know? Well, we'd love to have you on again. Thank um, you. I well, appreciate your show. Thanks for, for everything you do. No, thank you. And Grant, thanks so much for uh, not screwing everything up today. I appreciate it. And thanks, Jeffrey. And uh, thank go you. fuck yourself, Will. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> Love you too, buddy. See Bye. y'all. Bye bye. <laughs>
and like held it up, you know, to the to the mobs and was like, "What is this?" You know, yeah. um, it was really embarrassing for him. Yeah, because <clears throat> oh. he's like, "Uh, well, it's kind of the stuff I like put in my hair," you know. Mm. And people like staring, you know, a lot of rubbernecking going along, you know, going on in the in the security line, and they took the stuff from him and they took it and threw it away. And for all I know, the stuff costs, you know, like fifty dollars. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Right. No, my stuff cost. That happened to me. I had a big. I had just bought a big tub of it, and I forgot to put it in my, my luggage thing. Well, you just pork cost, fat. <laughs> yeah, pork fat costs. Thir- my thing costs thirty dollars. The guy takes it out. I go, "What are you doing?" He goes, "You can't take this on the airplane." Oh, and I'm man. like, "What am I it gonna do?" Bomb. Put it in the trash can, right? Yeah. I go. I know my gel. My gel is pretty rough stuff, but it's not gonna take an airplane down. Well, you know. Moreover, when has that ever happened? It, you know, an uh, uh, Italian-American kid flying out of JFK with a tub of explosives in his hair gel thing. I mean, Jesus, come on. That killed me. I was pissed. I was so 25 that, bucks. That really did happen to you. That is it very interesting. That's I, amazing because I saw this happen to a guy. I felt so bad for him. I mean, first of all, it was humiliating, but it was also robbery. You know? Right. No, it is, but, and I wasn't humiliated at all. I was pissed. I, go, I don't care. They'll I, wait all day. I've I've checked multiple firearms onto a plane before and picked them up on the other end of the of the airport. Really? Oh, multiple like, times. Like, wait, multiple wait, times. Handguns, rifles. No, no, I've checked them. I like, checked luggage. Oh, yeah, yeah, luggage. you can do that. Yeah. I don't think. You, but don't you have to declare them or something? I'm not. Yeah, you to declare them. them. They give you a little sheet. You you don't pay any extra money. That you declare them. They give you their stamp of approval, and it's off you go. That's cool. But uh, but it's the TSA that's you know just so so absurd you know. Oh, uh, every yeah. time they bother me too. I don't understand what it is about me. Take your sweater off. What do you mean? I'm it's freezing. I gotta take like you know what a nightmare walking through this. And then thing. they uh, they tell you that don't worry, we'll have the technology soon to where you don't have to take your shoes off. Well, good, <laughs> good, finally. Yeah. It's only been a few I, years. <laughs> I will be right. taking my shoes off forever. I know this because I I have. The shoes that I wear have steel in uh, in the uh, what do you call it? You know steel the toe? Thing. not not in the toe, but in in the shank. You know, yeah. um, because they're Alden shoes, and I so I just know that. <laughs> it's always the case, but mostly mostly uh, TSA leaves me alone. Where I have trouble is in going across the borders, uh, and particularly Ooh. to other countries in Canada. Um, and, and it's because they it, because they always suspect that I'm up to no good um, um, because of the way I'm dressed. Yeah, well, I look always, at that outfit. You must be a gangster. Like it's what are you? A gangster thing, right? They yeah. think I'm, I'm doing a drug deal. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm a pimp. You know. Right. Uh, I mean, the boat. Grant tie. never. Grant never has that problem. The planet and video calls. And moreover, I should add ever more people to the call, and we should all be able to talk in real time. Uh, and with no delays and 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 perfect acoustics and beautiful high definition video, That's and, right. and 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 when that doesn't happen, we're like, fuck, this is, <laughs> this is terrible, you know. What's cool, what's to your point, what's cool about it, we fill in all those gaps in our own mind, that ingenuity, you know. And then some people yeah. would think, gosh, I, you know, maybe I should create a system that does this, and how can I improve on it? And I think you know, it's part of the human character, I suppose. It is. That's a good. You know, point. I feel this. I feel this uh, sometimes when I get on when I'm on, a, on an airplane. I'm flying and uh, and I'm using you because know, they, you know, when airlines don't have Wi-Fi anymore, we're like, what kind of Flintstones thing is this? <laughs> and, and so, so when you do get on Wi-Fi, and then I'll sometimes get Skype calls, you know, Skype video calls from multiple people, and I'll try to answer them, and I and I can't do it, and they're like annoyed, like. What the hell's wrong? And I'm like, right. I don't know. I mean, this is bad. Right. <laughs> I'm ticked off when I can't watch a Netflix movie from my phone. And I'm thinking, wait a minute here. I'm watching a movie on my phone, and I'm mad because it doesn't come. It skips sometimes. <laughs> you know? So it's like going back to the days of the VHS when sometimes it was so the picture was so dark, you didn't know. I remember watching The Godfather on VHS. I couldn't see a thing. And now I have my phone. It's high definition, and I'm mad when it skips. Yeah, I ha- you know it's funny. I I there's I I everybody has one in every office. There's some one person who's on top of all the newest technology, you know, and uh, <clears throat> and I'm at Foundation for Economic Education, so I I brought in my my iMac, which I you know paid like twenty four hundred dollars for, you know, like yeah. eighteen months ago, right? It's got a giant screen. It's like the epic computer of all time, 
And so my friend Richard Lawrence, who's the chief operating officer, I invited him over and said, have a look at my machine. What do you think? You know, I, I was feeling really good about this. He, he took one look and he goes, he goes, oh, no retinas display, huh? Uh, <laughs> said, you can tell oh, that. Doesn't burn, doesn't burn your eyes open, huh? <laughs> yeah, and he said, I said, how, how did you know that? And he goes, oh, I, I can tell five feet away. I mean, just one quick look, everything's blurry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. It, yeah, to him it probably looked like the first television at the World's Fair. You know what I mean? <laughs> and to me, I I haven't even, I don't even know what a retina display looks like actually. I don't mine looks great and I have a I don't know. You know, I saw one at the Mac store, you know, a few months ago. The salesman was going, Here's a retina display and here's the old fashioned crappy display. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm looking, I'm looking at the two and I I just I didn't I don't see, see it. Yeah, I don't either, but I, I got, he says, uh, Richard says, that, that once you get the retina display, you adjust to it, and, sure. and, then, and then everything else just looks pathetic by comparison. Right. So. If you think, too, of the televisions, the first high-def televisions, I remember looking at them being like, oh, this is unbelievable. You know what I mean? And what was it, 1999, 2000, I think they started to get big. And then a few years later, it's like, geez, you, I'm like touch, going to touch the screen and think my hand's going to get wet. You know what I mean? It's amazing how it. Uh, I know. And I, you know, and it's funny too because I, you know, it's like, like I love all the new technology, but I'm not, I'm not entirely unhappy with the old. You know, I, right. I guess I, I have this memory. You know, uh, like, like truly, and I think, I think my parents maybe were a little bit not quite up on the newest thing in a way, but I mean, truly, gentlemen, this is actually a true story. <laughs> I, re I remember, and I might have been maybe five or something like that, and my parents might have been 10 years late getting this, but when we, when we got our first color television, I mean, I actually remember this. And it was, it was um, I guess we got it on Saturday. Or, or oh, was we're coming. live. We're live. There we go. Sorry I, about the delay. Thank God. <laughs> All right, everybody. But I think my chat has been zeroed out, unfortunately. You can't. Uh, you can't talk to anybody on there. No, I, no, I can, but I just can't see the old, the old thing. It also shows zero viewers. So does that? What does that mean? I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know. We had we had people here before, and now they're not uh, here. I don't see any. What I don't see what you see, Jeffrey. Uh, I don't, I don't are see you any seeing viewers. other viewers? Are you no. Talking, uh, you, you you don't see any viewers. You don't see. No, I don't have the. You have a Liberty Me screen, so you have like a moderator screen. Oh, so now I'm the master of ceremonies. Yeah, you're the. <laughs> okay, so what do we do about about uh, the well, this archives to YouTube anyway? So I don't it know. It does, okay. but 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 this link. Uh, uh, okay, so I guess people are now showing up. Okay. But uh, let me. Um, uh, okay, hold let on. People, me, yeah, let's see. Here we go. Here's the live YouTube. Um, okay, here we go. Um, all right, all right. I'm gonna post this YouTube um, link in the chat, uh -huh. and that way anybody can send it to anybody. I don't know how I suddenly became. Oh, I actually I do know why because I logged as Liberty.me. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. And probably kicked Daniel out, right? Sorry I don't that. think so. I don't. I think he can just come in and out. Okay. Um, but I, I'm a little bit alarmed because usually we have more people than this, and I'm just wondering if the if the, if the link changed. In some it, way. No, you know what it is? It's continuity. We're normally on Spreecast, and everyone's texting me confused now, even though I've posted the link numerous times. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And th and because in Liberty.me, the embed is still the Spreecast embed, right? Yeah, uh, no, actually, Mike took that off. So if people are going to that site today, they're not getting a link. Well, you can post on liberty.me uh, the uh, the live link. There's the YouTube link. Okay. okay. And uh, there's also an event page on on um, on Google Hangouts. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, uh... I, I, you know, there, I have some sense, actually, that, that these are sort of the early days of these these of this technology, in a way. Yep. Uh, I was thinking about this last night because you know here I am on with Austin Peterson and it's still just like wonky and delays and we had to bail from from the meeting. Uh, and 
you know, I wondered if it was like the early days of telephone in a way. You know, like everything's exactly. kind of vaguely going wrong, you know? I did a show, actually, I did a show a couple weeks ago where I made a joke. I said, you know, this is a new medium. This is the new, you know, medium of news and, and entertainment and politics and so on and so forth. But I said, we can't get a, we just can't get a steady, you know, uh, signal. You know what I mean? I'm thinking this must be, this is this must be, uh, have been what it was like in the 40s. You know what I mean? The 30s and 40s, newsreels, problems, radio, things like that. So this works. This works great, actually. We can all talk. We just can't figure it out now. It's, that's, you that's know, just that. and isn't it funny how our expectations are? Uh, there's something in the human imagination that that longs for 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 every conceivable miracle, and when they're not here. We're just a little bit bugged by it, right? It's like something like this, it 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 gives rise to to new possibilities in our mind. It's like exactly. Wow, I should be able to in real time, in a very intimate way, engage person to person. Anybody on this recommendation, then it was a law. And now now they realize that it's really important to enforce this. So um, so they said, you know, they found the first real violator, the first. The first real, I forget now what the word they used, but it was like scoff law or something. I mean, they used some like sort of wicked term to describe a person who was watering his lawn. It's probably like a throwback term too to like uh, the seventh century. Right, and, and they said they said well, and so uh, it turned out to be a franchise owner of a McDonald's who, in uh, the middle of the middle of the night, was watering no. the lawn. And but this was caught on a video camera. And the man was quickly ratted out, and you know the so, inhumanity. Yeah, right. So this person was, you know, <laughs> and and so uh, properly fined, dragged down to city hall, and fined, you know. And it's uh, a big fine. It's not a. It's not a little fine. It's right. uh, It's over five hundred dollars, I think. And it depending McDonald's, they probably hammered. So well, I know that's and, a personal fine. Right, and you know the other thing is like like why is McDonald's watering watering its lawn? I mean, it's like a public service. I mean, they they right. Want, they want to have beautiful things for other people. And this Curb appeal not, here. Right. It, it, this is not like some guy's home and he's just like right. in, a, in, a, you know, in an egotistical, you know, self-indulgent right. way wanting his green grass for whatever who's, reason. Like, who's going to go to a McDonald's when you see the little yellow stains or your grass is dying or your bushes are on? I'm, I'm not going to eat in there. Right. You know what I mean? So you know how many people you're harming by creating an incentive not to water or water their shrubs and then the people it harms that are working inside of it? And 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 for a majority of the reason is the smelt fish, this little fish that they were concerned about that they never kept, they never maintained water. They could have kept the water, but they let it flow out all out into the San Francisco Bay over the years, because because these politicians caved to environment, the lobbyists. You know what I mean? That's how resources are allocated through government, through lobbyists. Who pays me the most? Who gives me the most political power? And then we all suffer here. It's un it's incredible. Well, I and I don't remember the data, cause even though I've read it, you know. But but it's always shocking when you read it. Like like what percentage of California water use is actually you know domestic? You know, like right. Not much of it. Not much. I mean, no. it's very very low. And seventy three percent is in the is for the um is the inland uh, farms agriculture, and then I think yeah less than I think it's about twenty percent. Is left to the is is allocated to the cities or so on, but I could be I don't remember it well, exactly. If, if you look at okay, so I read somewhere that it's 1.2 gallons for a flush to flush the toilet, five gallons to take a shower. So if you figure conservatively, let's say three flushes per person, one shower per day, over what is it 40 million people every day doing that? That's a lot of damn water <laughs> every yeah, single day using. So to think right. that uh, that that resource can be centrally planned, it, it really is of no shock to me that there's a right. threat right now. That's well, yeah. it's true in a way. But you know, I, I I I when I was writing all this stuff about toilets and everything, I actually looked up like nationwide water use, and I was shocked to see that water domestic water consumption um, is something like yeah, it's it's a lot, but it amounts to something like three percent of the total. Yeah. Yeah, I read that one. That was good. What do, I think, do we, what do we export more water to other countries or something? Well, I think it's mostly industrial and industrial and use and, and agricultural use. You know, yeah. so so the, if you put a brick in your to toilet, you know, it might make you feel good or something. But um, and also, you know, the strange thing about it is like it's pretty darn important that we have good systems to to clean out our pipes and get rid of human waste and and wash our clothes and you know just normal. That's a net positive. Yes. Yeah. These are things that kind of need to be done. 
Grant, um, right, did you listen to that? Did you hear that, Grant? You see how important that is? I tell him off air all the time how important